And tonight we get to the subject of Europe in Bible prophecy. And we want to kind of jump back into Daniel chapter 2, where we had, of course, the dream that was in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, where Daniel is brought before the king Nebuchadnezzar, who has had the dream. And we read in verse 28 that there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And Daniel says to the king that he will make known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And he goes on to say that he reveals secret the secrets and makes known to thee what shall come to pass. So the vision Daniel has in chapter 2 that we've been examining over the past several weeks uh, of what, actually quite a period of time, is one that is, yes, to deal with history, but also takes us through to a picture of what's going to be in the latter days. And one of the things that we want to kind of emphasize as well is, is in this is that the reason God gives us these things in his word of truth, the Bible, is to prove to us his existence. And we read, of course, in Isaiah 46 and verse 9, we're told to remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And so that's what God does for us. He declares from the beginning the end, the things that are not yet done. And that's what Daniel is. It's a, it's a record of things that are yet to come to pass from Daniel's point of view. Um, but when we look at them, we see that they are things that are, in fact, have come to pass in the, uh, in the very uh, far distant past and in the not too distant past as well. So it's a privilege for us to have the word of God and to search these things out. But it's a privilege that's not given to just anyone. It's the revelation in chapter 1, verse 1, another prophetic book that follows on from Daniel, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So Daniel's prophecy, very similar to the book of Revelation and John's prophecy, is expressed by sign or by symbol. And it's about things yet to happen. In John's case, we're told they were things that were shortly to come to pass. And so the challenge to us is to correctly divide the scriptures so that we can understand it and have a perspective of what God has laid out for us in history and, and through prophecy so we can be assured that what he's got to say about the future, what is yet to come to pass, will in fact happen. And there is a blessing associated with this. It's not just an academic exercise that we can sort of tick and bob through, where we can say, well, this is interesting and that's interesting, and, and uh, we can recount some facts. That's not the point of it. The point is, is there's a blessing in chapter 1, verse 3 of Revelation, to him that reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So it's about reading them, about finding out what's in the Word of God, it's about hearing it, listening to what its message is, and then it's about keeping what is written therein, because the time is at hand. So if you've got your Bibles, turn them open, if you would, to Daniel chapter 2. Because this has sort of our, been our springboard passage for what we've looked at in our last several classes on this subject, and it's Daniel chapter 2, and we have for us there the vision that Daniel was to see. Well, it was actually the vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and he describes to the king what he saw in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. So this was a nightmare that Daniel but I was explaining to the king. And he tells us what it was made up of. This image head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. And this vision existed until Nebuchadnezzar saw a little stone that was cut without hands, verse 34, which smites the image on the feet that were of iron and clay and breaks them to pieces. And then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, uh, the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carries them away and there's no place found for them. 
and the stone that smote the great image on the feet would become a mountain, a great mountain, that would fill the whole earth. And so this is the picture of what Daniel saw was this great image. It was a vision of the night. It was a, a nightmare, dreadful and terrible. A head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, and legs of iron, feet part of iron and part of clay. And he tells the king in verse 36, we're going to tell you the interpretation of the thing. And Daniel says, look, it's not because I've got any special talent or because there's, there's something in me. He says, it's the God of heaven, verse 37, that has given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And he goes on to say in verse 39, there, that, or sorry, verse 38, at the end of it, thou art this head of gold. And then he describes a succession of empires. And we've looked at these. The first being the Babylonians, the head of gold. The Medo-Persians, the chest and the arms of silver. The belly and the thighs of brass, which would be the equivalent to the Greeks. And the Roman Empire that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, which would be the legs of iron. And so finally we come down to the last of these phases, which is the feet, part of iron and part of miry clay. And we just like to kind of focus on that in our, in our thoughts today and, and zero in on that specific part of it. So we're taking the others for granted, having spent the last six or five classes looking at them, and we're just following the succession that follows through uh, world history as it's been outlined by Daniel the prophet. So chapter 2 of Daniel, if you're still there, and verse 41. He says, whereas you saw the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom is going to be divided. And there's going to be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the ten toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom's going to be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So this last phase is a mixture of the iron of the legs, which is then sort of diluted with uh, a mixture, a compound of clay, and it holds together, but it is not as strong, perhaps, as the iron was in years gone by. And it's during this phase that we find that the stone is going to smite the image. Now, that is a description of the European successor to the Roman Empire, which we're going to spend some time looking at. But we'd like, first of all, to go to Daniel 7, which we've been doing in our classes, to take a look at the parallel prophecy to this in Daniel chapter 7, where we see in verse 3, there are four great beasts that come out of the sea, different from one, one another. The first is a lion that has eagle's wings. The second is a bear. And then the third is this leopard. The fourth is this, this dreadful and terrible beast. And so that's the picture that's given to us in Daniel chapter 7, is of these four beasts. And they correspond with the different empires of Daniel chapter 2. The lion being that of Babylon, the bear of the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks of the, or the leopard of the Greeks, and this fourth beast that's dreadful and terrible, which is going to take our attention tonight, it corresponds with the Romans, and it's got ten horns. And we're told there, the interpretation in verse 16, the great beasts which we see in Daniel chapter 7 are four kings, or four kingdoms, which would arise out of the earth. And the picture that we're given of this last phase is that it's different than the others. He says, I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it's got great iron teeth. It devoured in breaking pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it's different from all the beasts that were before it, and this one has ten horns. And so that's the description that's given in verse 7 of this fourth beast. And we go, we go on to read about this, that it's the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which will be different from the other kingdoms. This is the interpretation in verse 23. And what it's going to do is devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces. 
And it's described there in verse 16 and 17 as having, or in verse 7, sorry, as having these iron teeth, which relates it, of course, with the iron legs of the image. It's a picture of the Roman Empire, a picture of an empire that's going to break in pieces. But Daniel chapter 2 added that extra little detail that it's going to be partly strong and partly broken, and that it is going to be divided. Well, in the history of Rome, as we looked at, Constantine was the Roman Empire emperor who divided the empire into two, following Diocletian and the four emperors that he set up. He pretty much divided into two sections, and although his reign was very glorious, according to the historians, it was the beginning of the end. His division of the empire led to, led to its downfall. But when we look at this picture, we notice that there was two legs. And the left leg is that of the Western Roman Empire, centered out of the city of Rome, whereas the right leg um, is that of the Eastern Roman Empire, centered out of the city of Constantinople, which Constantine set up as the Second Roman Empire, also known as Byzantium. So he divided the empire into two, and from there, the situation began to dissolve. But we want to spend our time taking a look at the characteristics of this fourth system because we looked at the iron part of it and the Roman Empire itself in our last session. We want to focus this time, though, on a specific element, and that is the element of the horns. We read there that after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrible with the iron teeth, and it breaks in pieces. Well, that's the Roman side of it. It's different from the other beasts, and it had ten horns. And the interpretation is given as to what these ten horns are. We read that the ten horns, in verse 24, out of this kingdom are ten kings that are going to arise. So this great empire is going to have ten kings or kingdoms that are going to come out of it. And, of course, you can parallel the ten horns with the image, with the two feet. And, of course, most people's feet, anyway, have ten toes on them. There are some that have twelve. We do know somebody that has twelve toes. But usually, um, it's five toes aside. And that's the picture uh, that parallels with this, this beast in Daniel 7 and verse 24. Now, Daniel, though, doesn't stand by itself. It is a prophetic book talking about the future, and Daniel goes so far with it. But the, the nitty-gritty detail of, of how this whole ten-horn system is going to develop is really given to us in the book of Revelation. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 12, because here we find that Daniel, as he's experiencing these visions and dreams and seeing all these different things, he wants to know more. And we read in verse 8 that he heard, but he understood not, in chapter 12, verse 8, and he says, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he's told, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed and sealed up until the time of the end. And in the time of the end, the wise are going to understand. When we come to the book of Revelation, which was given to the apostle John in the Isle of Patmos, the things that are shortly to come to pass, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, we find the same book that was sealed back in Daniel's time being unsealed. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And so we have the unsealing of the book of Daniel in the book of Revelation. So this, this last beast system, which in John's time, was by then the Roman Empire, because, of course, the Apostle John lived during the first century when the Greeks had already disappeared, the Medo-Persians were long gone, the Babylonians were gone, but who was reigning supreme were the Romans. And, in fact, he was imprisoned in the Isle of Patmos at the decree of the emperor. So it was the Roman Empire that was already existing. Daniel's fourth beast was there, symbolizing both Rome and Europe in its last phases there. And what he was to see was the, the sealed vision that would be unsealed in the book of Revelation. 
So it would give further detail as to the development of this last beast or this last system. So Daniel's fourth beast has several metamorphoses that it goes through in the book of Revelation or several phases. The first of which is described in chapter 12. It's described as a pagan Roman dragon, or a great red dragon is what it talks about there. And it's, and it's paralleled with the pagan system that was there uh, when the Apostle John was there, would have an existence until the time period of Constantine. And then we come to Revelation chapter 13, and we have the appearance coming out of the sea of this rather bizarre looking creature. It's still got the ten horns, as did uh, the, the beast in chapter 12, it had ten horns but seven heads. Well, this beast also has these seven heads, this time they're leopards, but it's got the ten horns as well, and it equates with the Christian Roman Empire. We don't have time to get into all the detail of these, that would be a, a look at, at the book of Revelation as well, but we're just trying to plug this vision into its different parts. We then come to chapter 13 in the latter half, and we have this beast of the earth, which parallels the Holy Roman Empire. So Charlemagne would come along and he would resurrect what had been the Christian Roman Empire, um, and he would establish the Holy Roman Empire that would last for several hundred years. It would, of course, dissipate and finally disappear during the French Revolution, but we get the last system in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, where there would be a resurrection of this beast system, and uh, we've labeled it there as the European Union of today. And of course, there's a woman that rides upon it, which we'll look at briefly, which is the, the Vatican itself. So these are the phases through which Europe would go through, um, as described for us in the book of Revelation. So we'd like to begin, though, by looking at the, the ten horns of Daniel's beast. Remember that it had ten horns, and we're told they were ten kingdoms. Well, what happened was, after Constantine divided the empire in two, the eastern half of the empire remained intact fairly well until the 1400s. Um, but the western half uh, was picked away at by the different barbarian tribes. Um, this is a depiction of Alaric and the Visigoths, which are one of the groups that would come uh, in around 401 AD, and they came out of the kingdom, Daniel says. So out of the, the Roman Empire arose one of the barbarian tribes, and they would lay siege to different pieces of the Roman Empire and would begin this attack upon it. They were followed by Genseric, and Genseric led the Vandals. And you've heard of vandalizing something. Well, this is where the word comes from. It basically, the destroyers is what they were. And they invaded Carthage in North Africa, um, using ships, basically, they came across and um, they went into the area of Rome. And uh, when they were there, they pretty much destroyed the city, a pillage that lasted 14 days and 14 nights. And, of course, um, there remained uh, pretty well nothing that was public or private wealth that they didn't take away with them. They plundered all the treasuries of all the temples and took everything in ships across to North Africa. And among the spoils, as is depicted here, it is, it is said that there were relics of the two temples, um, or rather the religions, basically, and you can see the menorah there that's being carried off, which legend says was sunk at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea in one of the return journeys. But they came along and um, they sacked the area of Rome and destroyed great parts of it. Now, they were followed by 452 by a rather pleasant fellow named Attila. Attila was, of course, the leader of the Huns, and it was the Huns that were pushing all these other tribes into the Roman area, and it was during the reign of Attila, who became the terror of the world, that it urged the rapid downfall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon tells us. So what he did was he united the German Scythian kin kingdoms under himself and um, a huge swath of land there that you can see all the way back here into what we call Russia today. There's the Volga River right over to um, Europe on the, uh, the uh, western side there to the Danube. So it covers the whole area of Scythia 
and um, what we would call Eastern Europe today. And uh, that was the empire of the Huns. And he had a, a great, um, very fast, short-lived campaign, carrying, as it was, the Sword of Mars, as it was called, believing he was divinely um, entitled to claim dominion over the earth, and that's what he did. His empire went from the Danube to the Don, in what we would call in Ezekiel the area of Mago. And he died at the height of his power in, uh, in his sleep, following a, a drunken, some say he was poisoned at his wedding ceremony, um, but he died in his sleep, and that was the end of his empire. There was nobody that could hold it together after him. Well, they were followed in 476, and somewhat simultaneously, by the Goths, the Gothic kingdom of a man named Odoacer. And Odoacer came to Rome, and on the throne of Rome at time was the last Caesar, a man named Romulus Augustulus. And it's interesting, the first of the rulers in Rome was Romulus, the two boys, if you've ever seen the depiction of, of the Roman wolf. And you had Remus and Romulus. Well, the first was a Romulus, and the last was a Romulus. And the barbarians came along and basically overtook this whole area. And um, the emperor's father was executed, and uh, he was left pretty much at the mercy of Odoacer. And so what he did was he resigned as the emperor of the West, leaving Odoacer as the sole monarch, no longer the emperor, um, but simply the king. And uh, he didn't want the title of Emperor of the West, so he abolished it, because he didn't think it was really worth much anymore. And thus the Roman Empire ended around the year 476. So you had these barbarian nations that settled all the way through Europe. There was the Vandals in North Africa, the Visigoths in Spain, the Suvi in Portugal, as you would call it today, the Franks in France and Germany, Burgundians in what we would call Germany today, the Alemanni, in Austria, Ostrogoths in Italy, Lombards in Poland, the Jeopardy in Hungary, and pushing behind all of these, of course, were the Huns who kind of pushed the rest of them forward. So these were the ten uh, nations, or, or some of the, the nations, that came out of the Roman Empire and constitute the ten horns of that beast. But the story doesn't end there, because we read in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, that when he's considering the horns, behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So what happened was, is that three of them were removed, they were taken off, out of the way, and in their place came along this rather grotesque looking little horn. So the three of the ones that left were the, uh, the Vandals, the Visigoths, and the Huns, and they were replaced by this little horn. And this little horn has eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So that's its characteristic. It's got eyes like a man, so it's, it's a seeing entity. Um, but it speaks great things, which is blaspheming. And we notice that it made war with the saints. It goes on to say that the same horn was more stout than his fellows, and behold, the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So he's a blaspheming and persecuting little horn. So a power would arise that would both blaspheme and would persecute. Now, when we look back at the history of the Roman Empire, we see that this played out in the time when, of course, the Roman Empire underwent this great transformation from paganism to Christianity and then its division by the Roman emperors. In fact, when we read the history of Rome, as Gibbon lays out for us, and there are others as well, uh, one of them is a man named David Benedict, who wrote the history of a people called the Donatists. And the Donatists were believers who, believed in the, who lived in the area of North Africa. And he describes Constantine's coming to power and how that you go from pagan persecutors to now Christian persecutors. Remember that it was under the pagans that many of the Christians were persecuted. Nero in Rome, Paul was put to death, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos. 
Well, it all changed when Constantine came along. We read that in the early age of Christianity, the persecution of Christians by pains and penalties was by the worshippers of the false gods of the heathen. Different parties had their controversies, but they would have no aid from the secular powers against their opponents, had they desired it. But no sooner was the first emperor who professed himself a Christian seated on the throne than there was an entire change in the business of persecution, so far as the subjects were concerned. Formerly, it was the heathen persecuting the Christians, or the pagans as we would call them. Now, it's the Christians persecuting their recusant brethren who were supposed to be worshippers of the same God. And so what we found was that Constantine, when he came to power, took great efforts to try and quell the different factions within the Christian community because he had switched the empire over from paganism to Christianity and his power base was dependent on the Christians. The problem was the Christians, if you had three of them in the room together, you had four or five opinions on every subject. And so they would start debating amongst themselves. And these debates got a little out of hand. So Constantine tried to kind of shore this all up to control his power over these people. And so it was that he held a council at a place called Nicaea. And here we have depicted for us Bishop Nicholas there on the right hand side. And you can see his clenched fists. And he's having a debate, debate with Arius of Alexander. And uh, they're debating with fisticuffs over the doctrine of the Trinity. And whether or not it was a triune God or there was not a triune God. And so at this point in time, uh, Bishop Nicholas, who you know probably better as St. Nicholas or Santa Claus, is giving the, uh, the left hook to Arius um, in this debate. And of course, he actually won out. And in the background there, with a little uh, puff over top of him here, is Constantine the Emperor, who is presiding over this debate in the church. He's still a pagan at this point in time, but he was the one who would decide which doctrine won out. And so he was in favor of the Trinitarian doctrine. So because of that, it became the doctrine of the universal, or as it would be called, Catholic Church. And that's how it was decided. Um, and so it was that anybody who disagreed with this would then experience persecution. No longer Nero and his cronies and the rest of them persecuting, but now the Christian Empire persecuting anybody that didn't agree with the doctrine of the emperor. And so we read in a book by Eusebius, The Life of Constantine, as it's called, um, a description by Eusebius, the, the uh, Catholic priest, who um, was very close to Constantine and a great supporter of him, and this is what he has to say. There were the lurking places, or thus were the lurking places of the heretics broken up by the emperor's command. And the savage beasts they harbored, which by that he means those who held impious doctrines, were driven to flight. Of those whom they had deceived, some intimidated by the emperor's threats, disguising them, their real sentiments crept secretly into the church. So we see that there was a persecuting element that this, this horn power would take on. It would crush any voices of dissent. And so having banished dissension, he goes on, and reduced the church of God to a state of uniform harmony by getting rid of any opposition, he next proceeded to a different duty feeling it incumbent on him to expiate another sort of impetuous or impious person, the pernicious enemies of the human race. These were the pests of society who ruined whole cities under the specious garb of religious decorum. Accordingly, uh, by, other trans by other order transmitted to the governors um, of these several provinces, he effectively banished all such offenders. So he dealt with anybody who disagreed with the official doctrine of the church by persecution, by banishment, and by sending them out so that his foundation would not crumble, but it would remain solid. And so it was that this little horn power would end up persecuting the Christian people themselves, even though it was this Christian system that we'll see. 
So it's a persecutor, but it's also a blasphemous little horn. So it's adoption of certain doctrines um, under the instruction of Constantine. But it's also the decrees of other emperors, such as Justinian, in March of 533. So long after Constantine's dead, Justinian the Victorious and the Pious, um, the August, etc., etc., uh, who is writing to John, the most holy archbishop of the sacred city of Rome, the Patriarch. So this is the emperor writing to the Patriarch of Rome, the old center of the empire. He says, rendering honor to your apostolic throne and to your holiness. He goes on to say, we have always a great desire to preserve the unity of your apostolic throne. We have hastened both to subject and to unite to the throne of your holiness all the priests of the whole eastern region. Your holiness, who is head of all the holy churches, for through all, and it is said, we hasten to increase the honor and authority of your throne. So a debate had arisen because there was two Romes and there was two patriarchs, one in Byzantium or Istanbul or Constantinople, take your pick of the name. The other one in the city of Rome itself, there was a bit of a debate as to who was top dog. And so Justinian in 533 gives the decree that the patriarch of Rome would now be the head of all churches. Well, a few years later, this is backed up by another man named the Emperor Phocas in the year 606. This Boniface III, which would be the Pope at the time, obtained from Phocas the Prince that the apostolic throne of the blessed Apostle Peter should be head of all churches because the cosmopolitan or Constantinopolitan church declared that she herself was first of all churches. So again, the debate was still going on and... The, uh, the Pope Boniface III obtained from the Emperor Phocas the final decree that said, no, it is the papacy which is head over all the churches. And so it would be the leader of this whole system. It would have eyes like a mouth, a mouth, uh, sorry, eyes like a man, a mouth speaking great things, and it would be a persecutor of Christians as we read in, in uh, Romans, or sorry, in Daniel, of that stage of the Roman <coughs> Empire. Well, onto the scene, as the western side of the Roman Empire is crumbling away, comes a man named Charlemagne, Charles the Magnificent. He was the son of a man named Pepin, and he fought with the Lombards in Italy. Now, the Lombards were one of those barbarian hordes that came down. The name Lombard simply means long beard. And so uh, you could distinguish an Aryan Christian from a Roman Catholic um, because the Aryans wore beards and the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, what do you call them, regular Christians didn't. So that's what they called them the Lombards. They wore these long beards. So the Aryan religion had taken over that area because... It was under the persecution of Constantine that they pushed all the Aryans, anybody who wasn't Trinitarian, out to the corners of the empire. They banished them. But these men were preachers. And not all of them, by any stretch of the imagination, had the truth. But they were sent out to the corners of the empire, and they did what they did best, which was preach. So when the barbarians finally came into this area, they did have a religion. They had been converted from paganism but they had the Aryan strand of that religion. So when they'd come into Italy and they'd taken it over, uh, following Odoacer and the others, the Goths that had come in, um, they had established themselves with the Aryan religion. Well, Charlemagne was the son of the Catholic Church, and he came in and he pushed these Lombards out, and this is his throne room in Aachen in Germany. This is the throne where he was crowned, and he was crowned on Christmas Day, 799 A.D. So this is his shield, and this is the actual the bust of his, uh, I think it's part of his, his tomb, where they keep his, his bones. And uh, so he established what was called the Holy Roman Empire. It had been the Christian Roman Empire, but the, the, the Huns and Goths and everybody had come and carved it all up. So he amalgamated a piece of it back together again, he conquered the Vandals, the Visigoths, and the Huns, 
and he established in the center of Rome, in the area of France, Germany, and Italy, this Holy Roman Empire. And what he also did was he gave the areas that he had taken from the paper, from these, uh, these three nations, the uh, Vandals, Visigoths, and the Huns, he gave their crowns and their area to the papacy. And I should have had it on there, but there's a, there's a picture, of course, of the triple tiara, the, the crown with which the Pope is crowned. And they didn't use it for a while until I think they used it with this, this last one again, but it has three crowns on it. And there's lots of stories as to what those three crowns are all about. But when you reach into history, it was when Charlemagne gave these three dominions to the Pope. And, of course, those horns, the three horns of Daniel were plucked up, and this little horn uh, prevailed over them. But its character, if we remind ourselves of it, it spake great things, it's more stout than its fellows, and it made war with the saints, and it prevailed against them. So Charlemagne then, like Constantine, put into play a policy of forced conversions. And so we read from uh, the Columbia Encyclopedia, Charlemagne's struggle with the pagan Saxons whose greatest leader was lasted from 772 to 804. So how did he go about dealing with these Saxons, these pagans, and the others? Well, it's by a dint of forced conversions and wholesale massacres. So a nice Christian king. Um, and the transportation of thousands of Saxons to the interior of the Frankish kingdom. Charlemagne made his domination over Saxony complete. So he instituted a policy that would be followed by many different successors of expelling a portion, converting a portion, and killing a portion. And that's how they dealt with different religions in their area. And this is the great Christian king, Charlemagne, who began the Holy Roman Empire. Now, this is the beginning, of course, what is known in history as the Dark Ages. Dark because the light of the scriptures would be attempted to be extinguished. The Catholic Church wanted no competition. Uh, just like Charlemagne or Constantine's time, we couldn't have people with alternate opinions on different subjects. So what they did was they took all non-Trinitarian Christian books or non-Catholic books, um, including the writings of the Jews, and they burnt these Bibles uh, to eradicate anything that would not, um, or these writings, to eradicate anything that, that people could read and get the wrong ideas, quote-unquote, in other words, not agree with them. So this burning of Bibles began, and the Bible became banned for the common man. And that went on for hundreds, uh, over thousands of years. The last recorded Bible burning took place in Spain, in 1957. That's the last time this happened. So that's not all that long ago. And of course, there was lots of book burnings during the Nazi Empire um, during the Second World War. But this system, described in the book of Revelation in its sort of uh, period as the beast of the earth, is, is described in Revelation 13, verse 15, that he had power to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this is a parallel with a little horn that would persecute the saints. So it would persecute them by forced conversions, by intimidation, by expulsion, and by this inquisition that was established. And here you have a heretic wearing the hat of a heretic at the inquisition. And of course, if they would not agree, um, then they would be put to death. So they repented not of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. We read in Revelation 9, verse 21, regarding one of the judgments on one of these systems. So here you see Anabaptists who are burned at the stake in Amsterdam in or 1571 because they refused to accept the doctrines of this church. So it would persecute the saints. It would put them to death for a period of time. We read in a, a book called The Israel of the Alps, um, which is uh, quite a, a, a graphic read. It was written in uh, 1850, and you can get the Baptist Standard has republished it. But we read here, the writer says that entire families travel great distances to be present. 
They left their homes in the evening and traveled all night. At the outskirts of the villages, the men took off their shoes and walked barefoot along the silent street, lest the clatter of the iron-shod shoes should betray them walking along. The feet of the beasts, which bore the wife and child, were wrapped in cloth to prevent the noise. And so they would have covert meetings. This is a Bible class held in the Amsterdam River, um, in, uh, or sorry, in the, in the river near Amsterdam in 1579. They'd go out into the river because out there they could read their Bibles, talk about it freely, and nobody could listen in and hand them over to the authorities. A stark difference traveling all night on foot, risking life and limb. How long does it take us to get to the meeting room? When do we travel? What are we willing to risk to get here? How often do we just have other stuff to do? This is what these people did. Just like the Waldenses that we read about as well. They traveled all these distances and they weren't sitting in air conditioning. They weren't sitting in heated rooms on comfy seats. They were meeting out in fields, out in boats in the middle of the river. And so that's what these people had to endure. And of course there was the infamous Spanish Inquisition that was begun by Ferdinand and Isabella during uh, this period of time. 1492, of course, is when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It was also the year that all the Jews were expelled from Spain. And, you know, the horrors of the Spanish Inquisition and the terrible things that were done, you would think that the Catholic Church would be a little embarrassed about the history of Queen Isabella and all the terrible things she put in play. But no, they canonized her as a saint, somebody to be prayed to, to be honored. Thousands and thousands of people put to their deaths over a 350 year period. And so we read in Revelation 13 verse 15, he had power to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. And that's what happened. Here's the trial, this is from Israel of the Alps, um, of a Waldensian. So this is somebody who lives in the area of the Alps between France and Italy. And this is the recorded trial. It was all written down, kind of like the, the, the Nazis. They like to record their interrogations. So he's told, come to the mass or you're a dead man. His response, well, Jesus says, if you believe in me, though you were dead, you will live. Kiss the crucifix. My Jesus is not on that piece of wood, but in heaven, from which he will come to judge the living and the dead. Will you not kiss it? I choose not to be an idolater. But those were the issues. They had to believe in the transubstantiation. They had to believe that the priest was able to turn that little wafer into the literal body of the Lord Jesus Christ and they were to eat it. And these people said, no, that is not what the Bible teaches. They refused to... Uh, engage in cross worship, kissing crucifixes with Christ uh, upon them or anything along that line. They were not idolaters. They didn't go along with this pagan superstition. And because of it, they were destroyed. Because of it, they were burned at the stake. It's a very sad picture. It's children, victims, children of the victims, I should say. What they're doing is they're sifting through the ashes of their burnt parents to find something to collect so that they could bury them. That's how terrible this system was. And we mustn't forget that. This is the system that God will judge. And we read in the book of Revelation, true and righteous are their judgments, O Lord God Almighty, because you have judged this system thus. And it's not a repentant system. It's one that takes the heroes in their minds of this age and glorifies them. A book called The Inquisition, uh, a recent book, 1999, he, the writer tells us that to ensure the maximum number of spectators, executions, whenever possible, were performed on public holidays. The condemned would be tied to a post above a pyre of dry wood high enough to be visible to the assembled crowd. So let's do it on a holiday, a high holy day, 
and let's gather a crowd around and everybody can enjoy the show as they tie these people up and burn them to death. And you see, the thing is, is that they thought this was doing God a service. Revelation 11 verse 7 describes this time period that when the witnesses had finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit will make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them. And this is the depiction of massacre of the, the Huguenots who lived in France. And uh, it's the Protestants, and it was a plan that was approved by the Queen, um, which was, the idea was to summon all the, uh, the, the people together to a meeting, and uh, by night several captains of the Catholic Swiss mercenaries um, from the five different little cantons, some commanding the French companies, um, told them that it was the will of the king that according to God's will they should take vengeance on the band of rebels while they had uh, the beasts in the toils. Victory was easy, the booty was great, and to be attained without danger. The signal to commence the massacre should be given by the bell of the palace that would mark that they should recognize each other in the darkness. I'm um, sorry, marks that they would recognize each other in the darkness were a bit of white linen tied around the left arm and a white cross on the hat. So they'd mark themselves with a cross mark up on the forehead, tie a white armband around themselves, and they would go out and they would massacre the Christians. And they thought this was a great thing. In fact, they celebrated it. Revelation 11, 10 tells us that they, they dwell upon the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another. And so they struck this coin here uh, at the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day to depict the victory they had had over these, these heretics in destroying them and putting them to death. And so John says in chapter 17 of Revelation, verse 6, I saw this woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered in great admiration. And so this system has been drunk with the blood of persecution. And so Revelation 19, verse 2, that we cited, True and righteous are thy judgments, for he hath judged the great poor, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. The blood of those that have been taken to this inquisition, and have been put to death at her hand over all these years. But in the book of Daniel, we're told that this system wouldn't last forever in its ability to persecute. We're told that the great words and the persecution, the wearing out of the saints of the Most High, verse 25, that he would think to change times and laws, and they would be given into his hands for a definitive period, until a time, times, and the dividing of time. So when you take this and use the date for a year principle that's given to us in scripture, and you extrapolate this out, a time is a season. It's, it's a year, 360 years. Times is two of them. So that's 720 years. And the dividing of time is half of that, which would give you 180 years. For a total of 1260 years, that's how long this power would have this ability to do this. Now, if we were to begin with the blasphemy of Justinian in 533, proclaiming that the Pope would be the head over all churches, and go 1260 years, we would come out to approximately the time period of 1793. And it was around that era when things were percolating in France, and the French Revolution would begin. A revolt against tyranny and oppression. A revolt especially against the Catholic Church that had been enforced and empowered by the king. And it, was, it began at this, this prison here, the Bastille prison, where the heretics of the Inquisition were enslaved and were imprisoned. And this, of course, would continue as Napoleon would come along during the period of the, the vials of the Book of Revelation, and he would dissolve the Holy Roman Empire that had been responsible for these things. He would end the Spanish uh, Empire as well, and the Empire of the French, toppling the crown heads of Europe and replacing them, of course, with his own family. But he would go on from there in that he would also take the pro prisoner in the year 1809 and begin the end of the papal temporal power that had been in existence for all those years since the time period of Charlemagne. 
But there's another date you could go from, and that is the decree of Phocus in the year 606. Remember, Phocus uh, was 606. You travel 1260 years along, and you come to the year 1866, which also has great significance, because it's around this time that a man named Garibaldi comes along, who unites Italy and takes the Papal States away from the papacy, uh, removing papal temporal power completely in 1870 and darkening the kingdom of the beast. And in fact, you can see this cartoon, which is depicting Garibaldi as giving the boot, which is Italy, to the papacy and kicking them out of Italy, which of course they did. And so he led his black shirts under the flag of nationalism and removed him and made him prisoner in his summer residence of Castle Gandolfo, where he stayed for quite some period of time. So that's the, the picture of history that gives us. But the one thing we've got to remember, that this vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and the last little piece we're looking at at the feet, was to do with what would be in the latter days. So there has to be an answering system to this in the latter days. And what we find that in recent history, going back into the last century, there was an endeavor to reunite this European Union, this, this Holy Roman Empire. And of course, it began under a man named the Kaiser, which is the German version of the word Caesar, Wilhelm II, and he announced his plan to begin the First World War. And this is actually the map that he sees Germany going out and coming into the area of France and down into Italy and reuniting a Catholic Europe influence once again. And there's him reading out his proclamation. The papacy, depicted in this cartoon, was quite happy about it. The caption reads, Come on, come on, my sons, for 39 years we've waited for you in Rome. Since, of course, Napoleon and Garibaldi had been on scene. But, of course, the First World War would not see the Germans being victorious. Millions of lives would be lost, but Germany would be thwarted. Not to be done away with. Hitler would follow shortly thereafter with his vision of a new Europe. Das New Europa, called, of course, the Third Reich, or the Third Empire. The first being Charlemagne's, the Holy Roman Empire. The second being that under Wilhelm, the Second Reich. And the third being that under Adolf Hitler. And again, you can see the map, the map here and the plan was to take all of Europe here and then even push into Russia, which of course was his undoing. That wasn't to succeed either. But somehow, when we look at Daniel chapter 2 and verses 41 to 44, we're told that the feet, the toes, that are part of potter's clay and part of iron, this kingdom is going to be divided, but there's going to be strength in it, the strength of iron, as much as they saw as the iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the feet and the toes are part of iron and part of clay, the kingdom is going to be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas they saw as the iron and the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they're not going to cleave one to another even as iron really can't be mixed with miry clay all that well. And it's that era that the stone would strike. So following those two false starts in resurrecting the Reich, another attempt was made, begun in 1957, in Rome. Um, and this is the room where, of course, you can see the statue of the Pope down the end there. And... It's the signing of the Treaty of Rome, trying to bring together different parts of this European era. Now, we see it as the resurrection of the European Union or the European Empire. We're not the only ones. This is the uh, Sunday Telegraph from uh, quite a period ago, 1991. The, the article was, Now a Holy European Empire. And the writer says he calmly is preparing to assume the mantle, that's the Pope, which he solemnly believes to be his by divine right, that of a new Holy Roman Emperor, reigning from the Urals to the Atlantic. So people in the world saw that this was a brainchild of Catholicism, 
the woman in Revelation who would ride the beast. And more recently, this is just September 17th, 2011, The Economist, we read there that there is no recent close analog to the EU, EU um, says uh, Wilhelm Buter. As a blend of national and supranational, the EU represents the Holy Roman Empire, which united Central Europe in the 10th century until the time of Luther. Well, technically speaking, until 1806. So this is people in the world looking at what's going on and saying, this is the Holy Roman Empire being reunited back together again. This is another cartoon that was in the Prince George Citizen where I used to work years and years ago. And uh, just amazing, this one. Um, they're so cute when they're young, you know, when they come out of the little egg, but they grow into this great big monster, the European community, the EC as it was known then. And it's progressed, of course, greatly since that period of time. This is again September 2000, or this is August, sorry, uh, 2011, uh, talking about the problems in Europe and the, uh, the power that Germany has, the rise of the Fourth Reich, says the Mail Online, how Germany is using the financial crisis to conquer Europe. And it says that it would remove any pretense of democracy, that the things that they proposed to put in place, which of course happened in those 16 countries, for once you have lost control of your economy, you have lost your sovereignty. Where Hitler failed by military means to conquer Europe, modern Germans are succeeding through train, uh, trade sorry, and financial discipline. Welcome to the Fourth Reich, says the writer. So what this, this Bible describes is what's going to be in the latter days of this Roman Empire in its last vestiges is exactly what is being seen in the world around us. But of course, it's what shall be in the latter days. That's what the passage says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28. And this image had a head of gold. It's the head of Babylon. And of course, Babylon the Great, we looked at in our first in the series of classes, um, the Tower of Babel that we see here, back from the time period of, um, of uh, Genesis chapter 11, um, the beginning of the kingdom of Babylon. And it just happens to be that it's this that the nations of Europe have decided would make a good sort of poster for them. And so here is a poster of Babylon being built. You can see the 12 stars around it there. And the little blasphemous sign at the bottom, Europe, many tongues, one voice, as if to be in the face of Almighty God, who divided nations by language. This is the way Europe decided to depict itself as the Tower of Babel or Babylon being reinstituted. And not only that, Newsweek picked up on the same thing with the euro, the currency of Europe. And who's been pushing this from the very beginning? Well, of course, articles going back to 1989. The Pope moots United Christian Europe, calling for the creation of a united Europe. He's been behind these things right from the very beginning. And that's not enough, brothers and sisters and friends, Here's the picture of, you know, Babylon the Great. But when it came time to build the European Parliament building in Strasbourg, they decided they would model it on the same thing. And they've even built their Parliament building as a representative um, of the same depiction of Babylon the Great. This is what shall be in the latter days. All those threads that have been there through all history that we've been looking at over these series are all coming together. And of course, the Catholic Church is at the heart of this because it's described in Revelation 17, the last in the phases, the woman who rides the beast, her name is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. So it's no surprise that we see Babylon as a theme that's resurrected itself in Europe, the area over which the papacy has its greatest influence. And if, you know, that wasn't enough, there is always the... Babylonian lion uh, with the wings, which is in this case here on St. Mark's Cathedral. Um, again, picking up those same vestiges all the way back to Rome. Babylon today being resurrected in Europe. 
But what we look forward to, friends, is all of these things to change in the very near future. Because what we read about in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 34 is that Nebuchadnezzar saw until a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image on the feet that were of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold were broken in pieces together. All those nations united together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So we look to see the unification of those areas that were once Rome, that were once Greece, that were once Medo-Persia, and that were once Babylon. Whether it be Iraq, Iran, Greece, Italy, Europe, all of those nations being pulled together in one last stand. And it's at that point in time that we have the intervention of this little stone that will come and smite the image on the feet, which is the time period in which we live, and will destroy them, and will become a mountain that will fill the entire earth. And it's in the days of these kings, says Daniel, that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which is never going to be destroyed. And the kingdom is not going to be left to another people, but it is going to break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it is going to stand forever. And that is what we pray for when we use the words of the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And this whole system is going to be destroyed when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven and reestablish his kingdom, which was promised by the angel Gabriel to Mary that he would sit upon David's throne, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, as was promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, and as was promised to Abraham, that kings would come from him. So the nation of Israel will be that little stone, led by the Lord Jesus Christ, that will destroy this image. It's put a little differently in Daniel chapter 7. I beheld, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld till the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So it will be wiped away. It will be destroyed. But all this information is there, not to tease us intellectually, but rather to get us to think about what is about to happen. The Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, or chapter 3, verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, the world as we know it, the society that is as we know it, is going to be wiped away. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation or lifestyle and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. And what that's telling us, friends, is this. The bus is about to leave. The time has come. We're living in the time period of the Toe Kingdoms, in the days of these kings. The Lord Jesus Christ is all but here. We read in Revelation, or sorry, in Romans, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. That bus is about to leave, and the exhortation to us is that we best get on that bus before it in fact does drive away. So we have the opportunity now to make our choice as to what we want to do. The kingdom of men has enjoyed its glory for thousands of years, but it has come to its end. What we see going on in Russia today, as the Russian bear is moving in towards the European area, is simply the fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 38, Daniel chapter 11, all these prophecies that we've looked for for so many years, rolling out. And it's going to be replaced in the great victory the Lord Jesus Christ will have in the land of Israel, when it's destroyed on the mountains of Israel, it will be replaced, as we read in Isaiah 2, it will come to pass in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains and be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, 
Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion will go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's the promise of what's coming, a kingdom of God on earth, a kingdom wherein dwells righteousness. And we pray God that that day will soon be upon us.